one might say, oh my goodness, look at this. People who cut out coffee slept 30 minutes more per day. Therefore, avoid coffee, you'll sleep better, you'll have better health. Is coffee good or bad for you? Is coffee toxic? And this comes motivated from a conversation recently with my mother. She said, hey, honey, how you doing? I said, good mom, I'm going to be making an, an espresso here, then start my work day. And she replied, oh, you know, I worry about you. All that caffeine is bad for your heart. So uh, let's unpack this question. The data are actually pretty straightforward to answer this, but you may have heard something similar to my mother's remark, uh, such as this list of comments. Caffeine increases your stress hormones, cortisol. The diapertines will raise your cholesterol and your triglycerides. There's a cardiovascular tie-in. Uh, coffee contains acrylamide, which is classified as a carcinogen. So is this legitimate? Is this something that you should be aware of? Uh, coffee crops are sprayed with toxic pesticides. Chlorogenic acid will increase your homocysteine. And coffee is acidic and therefore will disrupt your gut. These are all comments and criticisms posed by healthcare experts, gurus, and if these are true, this would certainly sway me to follow my mother's advice to avoid coffee, espresso, and caffeine. But if they're not true, then we don't want to deprive people of consuming coffee. And what about some of what you may have heard that coffee has health benefits? So how do we reconcile the different opinions that pervade regarding coffee? Well, one of the things, as we have discussed so many times on the podcast, we should look to is outcome data over mechanistic data, meaning what happens to people when they consume coffee? Do they get healthier or do they become unhealthy? The reason why outcome is so important is it gives you the net effect of all of the mechanisms. And by the way, some of those mechanisms, some of those compounds actually have health benefits as well as the potential detriments. So we want to look to, okay, people who drink versus do not consume coffee. Is there a difference in cancer, in heart disease, in neurodegenerative diseases or cognitive decline? So let's kick off with a umbrella review. An umbrella review is a review of meta-analyses. So if you wanted to get a overview of an entire body of literature, all of the quality randomized control trials, and there's a lot of them, then you can perform this very high quality review, an umbrella review. And this one, uh, published in the BMJ 2017, reviewed 218 meta-analyses looking at the correlation between longevity, brain health, cardiovascular health, metabolic function, cancer, and depression. And so what did they find? They found a 30% reduced risk of stroke, a 30% reduced risk of diabetes, improvement in liver function, a 29% decrease in fatty liver, a 27% reduction in Alzheimer's disease, cancer was reduced by 18%, all-cause mortality or death from any cause was reduced by 17%. Cardiovascular disease was decreased by 15%. Depression was reduced by 12%. And metabolic syndrome was reduced by 9%. So this is a pretty compelling data point and at least gives us a bit of solace, but let's continue further. A observational study in about half a million individuals looked at a 12 and a half year follow-up of individuals and tracked death from any cause, all cause mortality, and also cardiovascular disease. And this is interesting. Benefits, so improvements in both all cause and cardiovascular disease or death were seen when consuming two to three cups per day, irrespective if they were decaf or caffeinated. So even more good news regarding coffee. Let's continue examining. This uh, study really has a, a fantastic data table. I will narrate for those of you just listening to this. There are two graphs, one plotting cardiovascular disease, one plotting all-cause mortality. And on the x-axis, you're seeing cups per day from zero to five or more. 
and then you're seeing on the other y-axis the hazard ratio. And as you can see, whether it be decaf, instant, or ground coffee, all of the risk decreases when you go from zero cups to one, and it seems to maybe be the lowest between one to four cups per day. So the greatest reduction in all-cause mortality or cardiovascular disease death. But then when you get to five or more cups, you start losing the protective effect. So like many things in biology, there appears to be this Goldilocks zone. Meaning, yes, if we paint a picture of uh, arbitrarily here, the, the burnt out ER doctor who's surviving on caffeine and having five, six, seven cups per day, that's unhealthy. But one, two, three, four cups, this seems to be where there is consistent benefit, at least according to examining this through the lens of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease. So a very elegant study, very compelling data further yet still. So maybe to shift gears for a minute, what is it that is giving coffee some of these health benefits that we're documenting thus far? Well, this is a nice schematic appearing in Nutrients, the journal Nutrients 2020, polyphenols, which are antioxidants and also anti-inflammatory, caffeine, which increases dopamine and also therefore alertness, contains tryptophan, which improves serotonin levels, has a motility enhancing effect through the chlorogenic acid and the fiber. So here is a series of mechanisms that are health promoting. We open with a series of mechanisms that may detract from health, but again, outcome over mechanism, let's keep looking at what happens to people regarding their health when they consume coffee. This next study, also a very interesting design, randomized control trial, so we're protecting against the placebo effect, 100 healthy subjects. They were either randomly assigned to do nothing or to have two-day periods where they consumed coffee or um, avoided coffee. And here's what they found. Again, this schematic is showing you that in those who consumed coffee, they actually slept 36 minutes less than those who avoided coffee. Now, if taken the wrong way, one might say, oh my goodness, look at this. People who cut out coffee slept 30 minutes more per day. Therefore, avoid coffee, you'll sleep better, you'll have better health. But remember, we already covered a number. Pretty much every condition studied has shown improvements in their health. So it may not matter. And perhaps the 36 less minutes of sleep is negated by this other finding, this chart to the right here, where you're seeing those who consumed coffee on average took 1,000 more steps per day. So how exactly we weight these, it's a bit unclear until we look at the outcome data and see that there is clearly health promotion. But very interesting study, people tend to sleep a little less, move a little more. Again, if you wanted to be dogmatic about this, you could use this as evidence to say avoid coffee, but when looked at in the context of the outcome data we've examined thus far, pretty clear that coffee has a net benefit and you may actually sleep less, have a little more productivity, take more steps, and still see all of those conditions decrease regarding their risk rate or their hazard ratio. And as a gut geek, what about coffee and gut health specifically? This observational study, now observational data is not super high quality. However, this study looked at about half a million, 425,000, 100,000 to be exact, individuals, and there was some controlling for confounding. So albeit imperfect observational data, it does give us a good vantage. And they found that more than four cups per day reduced IBS risk, irritable bowel syndrome, by 19%. And one to three cups per day reduced IBS risk by 8%. This to me is actually a little bit counterintuitive. I would think, just going uh, based upon assumption, I suppose, that if you were having four or more cups per day, that might aggravate your, especially if you have diarrheal type IBS. 
But this is why we have to make our decisions data-driven and not uh, due to emotion or always on intuition. Although I'm a big advocate of listening to one's body, um, this would suggest that if you have IBS, you don't need to be avoiding coffee. And in fact, there can be the conferring of health benefit um, you know, anywhere between one and four cups per day. You don't have to drink four cups per day, but this is what this study found. What about the microbiota? Another observational study in about 150 healthy subjects looked at stool samples between non-coffee consumers, moderate coffee consumption, and high coffee consumption. And what they found was coffee consumers had no difference in lactobacillus bifidobacterium or the mucophilic fecal, ba uh, fecal bacterium prasnitsi. So there doesn't seem to be any appreciable impact on the microbiota either. So no impact on IBS or a favorable actually effect on IBS and no impact on gut microbiota composition. And what about ulcerative colitis? A meta-analysis of six observational studies. Again, observational data is imperfect, but when we're getting to this level, meaning six meta-analyses, if there was a signal of detriment, we'd probably see it. And there was no impact of coffee on ulcerative colitis risk. And another uh, similar study, no effect on Crohn's disease risk. Now, regarding confounders, it's important to delineate how important controlling for confounders is. It always is, but it's different to varying degrees. If we're talking about behaviors that tend to cluster with other healthy behaviors, then it's most important. But I can't say that coffee is known to cluster with higher socioeconomic status, higher levels of education, um, better access to healthcare, right? Because coffee is a ubiquitously consumed and inexpensive and readily available compound. So even though I appreciate a regression analysis and in, in the importance of controlling for said confounders, I'm not convinced they're leading to a skewing of the data set across these studies. And remember that many of these studies, to a greater or lesser extent, did attempt to control. So then we come to the question of how much coffee would be ideal for conferring these health benefits. And thankfully, there's research here. Coming back to that same BMJ uh, umbrella meta-analysis, they concluded or commented, coffee consumption is generally safe within usual levels of intake. The largest reductions for various health outcomes is three to four cups per day. More than I consume, but you know, there you have it. So to tie this all together, how much coffee for your health? Three to four, eight ounce cups. That is important to delineate. There's a big difference between an eight ounce, 12 ounce, and 16 ounce cup. So three smaller cups, eight ounces. Remember, you can benefit from just one cup per day, and it does not have to contain caffeine. The upper limit for caffeine maps on to these guidelines of 400 milligrams per day or less, which would be the equivalent of four to five cups. Who should avoid? Those who are pregnant or those who are at risk of fracture, meaning those who are osteoporotic or osteopenic. Potentially those with heartburn or indigestion, because some people may see an exacerbation of this sort of dyspepsia with caffeine. And this ties into my next point, which is listen to your body. Uh, I, when my gut was very sensitive, didn't do well with coffee nor espresso. And once I got through sort of the, <laughs> the brunt of the healing curve and I wasn't reacting to nearly all foods, I noticed no problem at all with coffee and actually have come to enjoy it uh, quite a bit. And the other key point here, because some people will say, I stopped drinking coffee and I felt better. There could be a few reasons for this. One, placebo. Two, you could have changed other things at the same time. Hey, I'm on a health kick. Let me improve my diet, my lifestyle. I'm going to cut out coffee. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to start exercising. So we have to be careful to look at a sort of multiple intervention approach and then assign the benefit to one of those interventions. Thirdly or fourthly, uh, they may be not having the 
you know, Starbucks loaded with a ton of garbage, including, um, you know, very high levels of sugar. And that could have helped them. And additionally, if people are consuming coffee too late in the day, that in many people would interfere with their sleep and vis-a-vis -vis the improvements in sleep, they could see health benefits. So as long as you're stopping your caffeine consumption at about noon, assuming you're going to be trying to go to bed sometime between 10 and 12, then you shouldn't have an impact on your sleep and can consume coffee without any worries regarding deleterious health impact. So mom, this podcast is for you. Here is a review of the evidence and we really gave this a lot of thought. And while sure, there are a couple instances in which you want to avoid coffee or caffeine late in the day, pregnant, those who have poor bone mineral density, potentially those with heartburn or indigestion, Outside of that, pretty compelling and conclusive data showing us that the consumption of coffee or espresso, whether caffeinated or decaffeinated, actually has multiple health benefits. So I would advise you to enjoy coffee and not fall prey to some of the fear mongering that you sometimes see online accompanying this topic. So uh, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of espresso, enjoy it, and hopefully this helps. All right, guys. Talk to you next time.